So this is Monday night, our third Monday in September, in case you're watching later or much later. And as I mentioned in the, the event and then in the post that I shared, we were going to, you know, if you watched last week's, so you'll remember that I said we would be talking about healing, uh, walking through our spiritual vision. Um, this week, though, as I prayed through it and really just tried to hone in what I wanted to share about vision, the, the emotion of unworthiness kept coming up. And that is an emotion that also is meant to be dealt with in this month. So if you are new um, to our time together, we've shifted our focus from uh, summer prep to more of uh, following um, the Hebrew mindset, that idea, the calendar, and they walk through different months, uh, similar to we that we have, but you know, as far as the timing, but they call them something different. And there's this grace in this time and this um, sort of window of opportunity to heal certain emotions within those months. It's very similar to the Chinese calendar where you would um, work on your heart one month or your liver another one, sometimes your kidneys, just depending on the season. And God is so kind that he carves out certain seasons to deal with certain emotions. And I think it's really powerful, especially if we think about our vision um, in the Hebrew calendar, this time in, in their um, view and mindset it will end the, their new year and or excuse me, their old year and become a new year, I believe next week, actually. So they'll have 5783 is their new year. You guys can look up that. I don't want to spend our time talking about a different calendar. But with that, as they enter into a new year, they're sloughing off things that are like unworthiness, healing a, your vision so that you can have a vision for the future. We dealt with the emotion of rejection our first Monday. So if you miss those, please go back and listen to them, rewatch them if you if you like that will really build. These are all individual but build on each other. So tonight we'll discuss the idea of worthiness. I pondered this so much this week and wondered why why is unworthiness such a big deal? When I first started a business with Young Living, that was one thing that was an overarching theme in any business class I took, um, any, I don't know, any of those uh, coaching classes, whatever, there was always this thought and discussion of feeling worthy, you know, do you feel worthy? And we are taught to um, use our affirmations, right? Things like, you know, we want to say that we are worthy. We want to declare it. We want to speak it out. We want to make sure that our conscious languaging is on point so that we're always speaking these life-giving words. And yet that is only hitting one of our senses. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I just want to plot that in your mind that you and I can sit here and say, I'm worthy all the live long day. We can even wear this cool t-shirt that they sell at the mall now that says, I'm worthy. Uh, we can wear that. We can tell people, we can even coach people and tell them. But until it hits your innermost being and you start to deal with the reason why you don't necessarily feel worthy, especially in specific areas that matter, meaning um, your trade, your, your job, perhaps if you're looking for a spouse or you want your spouse to treat you different or your children or your friends or whatever, any of those really meaningful areas, you again, you can say it, you can proclaim it from the rooftop, but it has to get into here, into your being. It's an inside job as all emotional healing is, and yet this one is a bit sticky. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to walk through some breathing time. I want you guys to get to a space where you are just things that are in your mind, just clearing it out. Um, in our emotion classes, we call this a brain dump time. I want you to just settle yourself in. And if you're watching later, then, and you're listening in the cars, this is what I do when I listen to certain videos, then just pause it, get to a time where you can have a moment to sit and be still. So what we're gonna do is take your oils, just have it to the side. 
um, a pen and some paper. We're going to do some brain dumping for the evening. It'll only be a couple minutes. And I'd like you guys to clear out your thoughts for the day so that you can get ready to receive everything that we're going to share tonight. Everything that is for you, I should say. So the brain dump is getting what's up here in your mind, everything you're thinking about, because whether you are really your intent is to be listening to me or not, there's always something in the back of your mind that's, you know, something from the day, something that has occurred, um, getting that out on paper is ideal. So the first thing that we're going to do is breathing. Let me just take you through a 60 second breath work. I'm going to set my timer because otherwise I'll just breathe all, all day. Feet on the floor. If you walked with me through this, you know the drill, but if you are new, what we do is we just take a time to center ourselves. And I keep saying feet on the floor because I want to make sure that that is so in your mind that we're not crisscross, we're not uh, walking around, just plant your feet. Deep belly breaths. And you're going to take it in for a count of five. Hold it just for a sec, and then you're going to exhale it out. And I'm going to start the timer now. So breathe in real deep and then exhale it out. Let's do it again. Breathe in. And then exhale it out. Breathe in again. Exhale. In these last 20 seconds, when you exhale, I like you to just really blow it all out. Last time, breathe it in really strong. Hold it for a sec and then blow it all out. Perfect. Through that one minute time, you should have started to feel your heart settling in, your heartbeat slowing down, your mind starting to clear. So we're gonna set a timer for just a couple minutes. And I tell you about the timer, I am not concerned if you go over or you don't do it as long. The reason why I have a little timer is so that if anybody is uncomfortable with writing, to journal, to brain dump, or whatever, that you know that there's an end point where we're gonna move forward. But we're gonna do a brain dump for two minutes, and all I would like you to do is just write down what's on your mind. And here's the prompt. What is one thing that you did not enjoy today? Just take two minutes and write down something that you didn't enjoy. As you're journaling, why did it happen? Could it have been avoided? And then process through how could the situation be improved? Should it happen to come up again? So we're just getting any of our thoughts that are not gonna help us through this time tonight. We're getting it on paper, so it could just get out of our heads. If you've run out of things to write, keep writing. Look around your room, what color are your walls? What sounds are you hearing besides my children doing dishes quite loudly? Whatever's on your mind. Okay, and that's the end of our time to brain dump that. If you want to keep writing, if you're enjoying the process, feel free. You'll be able to have the replay and go back to this. This is your time. But if you're ready to move on, take whatever oil that you chose to have with you tonight. Just take a moment, one drop, palm of your hands. 
So we're gonna clear out any of that junk. I'm choosing cedarwood because I love that oil to retrain my brain. Cypress is another one. I believe Lisa, someone shared recently that it was good for grief. So I've added cypress to huh, pretty much like all my blends, lovely. So just take that, we'll do one round of belly breathing. Exhale that out. Another thing I like to do is rub the oil on my hands just to kind of almost like I'm washing my hands of what I would just thinking. Okay, so it wasn't you, Lisa, but yeah, right? Good to know. Now, the second thing we'll write down for the next few minutes, and you can number it, whatever, you, whatever feels right to you, but ask yourself, what are five things that I did enjoy today? What are five things that I did enjoy? I'll give you a minute to do that. Let's do this for a couple more seconds. Okay. If you are enjoying the process and you wanna just keep writing about your day and how great it was, please feel free. Again, this is your class, this is your time. These are just steps I'm guiding you through. But if you're ready to move on, let's go ahead. The reason why I have us do this tonight, particularly with this topic, is in the writing, we are able to recognize what was hard in the day, assess it, and see if there's any wisdom to gain from it. Then we're able to see what a great day it really was, and we can allow that to be on the forefront of our minds and as we move into more of a learning time. This is a practice that I started with my children years ago. Many of you know I homeschool my kids. I have for quite a long time. Um, and we did this probably about seven or eight years ago. And I just had them start brain dumping. And it was a, it was a season in our lives where a few of my children were not so delighted to um, really do anything that I asked them to do. And so they were able then to just write it. I said, guys, this is your safe place. If you want to write, mom is irritating me. I don't even want to be homeschooled. Or I don't want to do this today. Then just feel free. And it was a safe place for them to do that. And within, we would spend about 15 minutes doing it, breathing in oils and have the diffuser going. Within about 15, 20 minutes, I, their moods would shift, their attitudes would change. And every time we did the brain dumping, they would have an exceptional day in school. That's not to say if we missed a day, they didn't. It was just, we never had a time where it wasn't good. If you are someone who is in your head a lot where you tend to process and think and you don't really verbalize it, this is a great tool to have for a non-verbal community. You know, people who do better processing, this helps get it out here so that you can actually see it for what it is, whatever the it is, assess it, and then move forward. So I'm gonna have you apply your oils again, just another drop. <clears throat> We're gonna breathe it in. Okay, let's move on. So tonight may feel like a series of questions, but really when it comes to this topic of worthiness, we, are, we all sit in different camps. Some of you feel amazing and totally worthy and you're probably in here listening to gain some wisdom on sharing with somebody else. Maybe you have a family member, maybe you are a coach as well and you just want to just share with them. 
But if you are in that camp where worthiness has been a struggle, perhaps even a, an adult lifelong struggle, you're going to be asking some questions. So the first one is look at yourself in your mirror. What do you see? And my daughter, she calls it the mirror app, which is on your phone. It's your camera, which I just crack up at that. Um, she's like, mom, open your mirror app to put on your lipstick. Okay. So if you want, you know, hide yourself here and just look at, look at your mirror app or look at your face in the Zoom call. What do you see? Write down the very first word or phrase that pops in your mind. Don't judge it. Don't try to assess. Just write down what comes to your head. What do you see? Then ask yourself, look at what you wrote, what you said. Whose word is that? Where did it come from? I guess it's a twofold question. Whose words are those? Where did it come from? Whether it's a positive word or a negative, it's important to know where the words originated from. We can build on that or we can tear it down and build new. Most of the time when I talk about emotional healing and we, we walk through these processes, I think we tend to think more on the negative terms, but many times, especially if you walk with me for a year or two years, three years, four years, some of you guys, we've walked, worked together for four or five years now. Um, you know, there's a lot of times where we're on, we're good. We're on the upswing. So we want to build on that and we want to capitalize. So whose word is that? Where did it come from? If the words were positive, acknowledge where they came from. And if it's from a person, bless that person. Take the time right now just to speak a blessing over them. There's no time and space in the spirit realm. So you, that person can hear, their spirit can hear you speaking to them. Pray for them. Thank God for them right now. Maybe even write a little post-it note. I bless so-and-so. I'm so grateful for this person. If it's God, just thank him and bless him. Thank him for those words that are so embedded in you that when you look in your mirror app, you can say something life-giving and positive. If the words or the phrase, the word or phrase, I should say, was negative, then you know it's a lie. You know that. That's why we're here. And since you're here, let's just agree that this is the time to work on removing that lie from your consciousness and your subconscious mind. We'll work on that. So with that in mind, the nice thing is, is as we start to do the next process, which is an aroma boost, we all now are collectively on the same page. If the words were negative, if they were positive, let's just put a, a pin in that for just a sec. Let me work with those who have had um, a negative word that came to their mind. So an aroma boost, if you're not familiar with it, it's, I call it like a mini AFT, right? Where you need just like a quick... I was about to say like five words all at once. Hold on. Let me rewind that. It is if you need to shift your mind, your mindset, your mind, your situation into something more positive, life-giving, deal with the trigger, something that's tripped you up and you're like, ah, kind of like, just like I did just now when you're, maybe you're running along, all of a sudden you trip over a rock that seemed like a big boulder. It's that. Nothing major, but you're just wanting to work on it and just clear off the slough. So while we're all together in this space, if you had that, if you're in that camp that had a negative word, our situation typically in step one of the aroma boost is you want to, you assess or say what there's a situation, there's a circumstance that's not benefiting me right now and I need to deal with it. 
So right now we would all have the same collective. There was a negative voice, a negative thought, a negative something that popped in and I don't want that. And I want to remove that and work through that. So that's step one. So we'll bump up to step two since we've already walked through that. And step two would be, what is one word to describe a feeling that you have when you look at that word, that phrase that came up? What's a one word feeling that you, that you would have? What can you assign to it? You can private message me, you can share in the chat. This is a community effort. So feel free if you rather keep it to yourself, then that's fine too. The third step of that is where are you feeling that in your body? Maybe the word that came up was frustrated. Where are you feeling frustrated? As we settle ourselves in with breathing and using our oils, that's another way to help us get in tune with what our body is feeling. If you do this long enough, you can literally feel emotions trapped in your hands. You can feel it in your shoulders, but not all your shoulders, maybe just certain parts. You can feel it in your chest, but not all of your chest. You start to get really in tune and almost like you can find that emotion where it's at. So really sit and think, feel it. And now you move on to the next step, which are the negative thoughts that pop in. Is there anything else that's coming up that's tied to worthiness when you look in the mirror? Just take notice of it, write it down. Typically in an aroma boost, we would use lavender, frankincense, stress away. Those are the trifecta oils that um, Dr. Perkis came up with to go, you know, to help uproot any kind of negative emotions and put in some positive ones. And our time together tonight, I want to play around with some oils. And that's why when I emailed you all, um, or if you saw it in the post, it was more whatever you, whatever oils that spoke to you, whatever oils were your oils that you enjoy. Some suggestions would be those three, if you have them within reach. If you only have one, use that. We shared about this a few weeks ago, but essential oils, when you breathe them in, they have the power within 20 seconds to start working on your brain, the actual brain, to rewrite miswritten information in our DNA, in our brain waves. It connects, um, um, not connect, excuse me. It helps remove any kind of those actual grooves that happen from thoughts that we have have had, have been spoken to us and creates new ones. And really, if you think about the oils, they all have sesquiterpenes, they all have monoterpenes, they all have phenols. They just have a varied amount of each. Some are better for others, but they all pretty much they do the same thing. And I never want us to get hung up on, oh, I have to have these oils or I can't do this process. Everyone, I have walked through this with our starter kit, the starter collection, using purification. What else do I have here? Panaway. Panaway has helichrysum, which routes out anger. It's cool to play around with your oils. So with everything that you just wrote down, the feeling, the place in your body, negative thoughts, take whichever oil that you choose, or chose rather, and breathe it in. Take one minute to just breathe. Notice what's happening to those emotions as you breathe. Notice that space in your body. Keep breathing your oils. 
keep journaling if that's what you're doing. Notice if there's a shift, notice what's happening to the feeling, what's happening to the space in your body. Are the thoughts getting less? And since we're dealing with and talking about the emotion of unworthiness and freeing ourselves into that worthy state, I'd love for you when you're ready to ask this question. When you look in the mirror, do you see someone who is gorgeous and a work of art? Do you see someone who is gorgeous and a work of art? If yes, then is that what you tell yourself? If no, we go back to what we mentioned a few minutes ago, whose word is that and where did it come from? If it's a negative word, it is a lie. Because of the nature of this class being all of us together, um, it's not necessarily a time for a one-on-one, -on -one, but if you have some, some extra sticky times where you see, yes, uh, I've got some negative words that, you know, they're spoken this, this, or this, it's something that you understand you are worthy, you, you believe it, but it's not in your soul, in your spirit, it's not a part of you, this might be a time to reach out for some extra coaching so we can deal with your specific stuff. But I will say, Deb, Lisa, you guys, and Sarah, you guys are probably going to laugh because you hear me preach the good news of journaling all the time. But journaling, right? Thank you, ladies, for showing your journals, you know. But journaling this out, asking yourself these pointed questions, why, where, who? This will help you. Sometimes you get to a point where you've done all, it's like, okay, I'm this one issue just won't budge, then you reach out. But everything that we do in our time together really builds so that you can go back and say, yes, I've, you know, Jen said this, or I heard these people say, I read it in scripture. I am not feeling it. Why? Who said that? Where's it coming from? Telling yourself you are gorgeous and a work of art is more than telling yourself an affirmation. Telling yourself you're gorgeous and you are a masterpiece is more than just saying it. Affirmations are words that we speak that help to retrain our brain. The word of God says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And sometimes we have to transform our brains from the religious stuff that we've heard all our lives. There's so much, um, hmm, there's so much that's laid on us that is not from God. So many times you have to curate, we've talked about curating your circles, the people in your neighborhood. Many times you have to cut out those thoughts. Affirmations are words that you speak that will help strengthen your brain, strengthen your mind, strengthen you so that you can actually receive the truth. And that is that you are a gorgeous masterpiece that was created in the image of God intricately, just very detailed, specific, designed 
to do some pretty incredible things. In order to get your whole person, your spirit, your soul, and your body on board, we also must engage several senses. So when we speak affirmations, this only addresses one sense, and that's our hearing. If I say I'm worthy, right? I mean, I'm saying it, so my ears hear it. That's just one sense. But we have several other senses. We have taste. We have touch, we have smell, we have sight. So we speak out our affirmations. This is just addressing the hearing portion of our senses. We breathe in our oils. We do that at the same time. Well, now we've hit on two of our senses. If you do those two things, and at the same time, if you're working on the idea of worthiness here, and you start to treat yourself maybe to a favorite beverage or a food at the same time. Well, now we've hit on taste. So now we have three. It's powerful because food, especially if you engage that last one, food can often be used as a source of comfort. I like to say our food is the acceptable Christian crack. So, you know, we uh, get on my little soapbox because this is my, my class right now. I can pretty much say whatever, right? Um, when I've gone to any sort of church event, there's always a ton of food and about this much of it is life-giving. And I'm like, I feel like there's something about gluttony in the Bible. I, I mean, I call me silly, but um, this... And I'm not really allowed to talk about food anymore. I was banned by God and my husband. So it's not, um, it's not a, a, sore, a subject I really touch on much, except that when I moved to the state of Texas, I was like, people really like their barbecue. And I feel a little concerned about that on the level of um, heart issues we have going on here. That being said, many times food is a source of comfort and is not actually healing. So if we are in a mode and listen, listen to me, your body, your soul, and your spirit, they know what's life-giving for you. So if you, with intention, just like our oils, right? With intention, if you say, what food is going to bring me life? What's, what's a food, a beverage, something that I can engage my taste so that as I'm working on this worthiness thing, it will trigger this feeling that I feel worthy. You know what? Your body, your spirit, your soul will tell you. You follow the same God I do, he will tell you. I get weirdly excited about tabbouleh. Now, I don't know if I have any other tabbouleh friends here, but it is one of my favorite foods in the whole wide world. A little thing of tabbouleh, some crumble of feta cheese, and a homemade pita. My gosh, I'm so happy. I grow mint. I hardly use mint, but I grow mint in pretty much like every house I live in because I like to go out and pick the leaves and smell it. And then I just eat it. Does anybody else do that with mint? Deb, right? I feel like we are kindred spirits in that and in so many things. So I'm engaging my sense of smell. I'm engaging my touch because I love the way that it feels. I'll eat it. I'm outside. And as I do this, and you do that, you all know what is your thing. Yes, Lisa, you need to get some mint. Oh, right, Brenda, so that probably makes you think of your grandmother. See, and now you're triggering, I'm assuming a good memory, so as you engage in whatever is your thing and you're purposely with intention, touching on as many senses as you can, all of a sudden you are, you are creating this environment for yourself that is ripe for healing. And in this month, in this time, as we talk about healing from rejection and we wanna be in acceptance and in community, and isolation, and we, and we are seeking to create a, a, a new 
space of people who are life-giving to us. And as we heal from unworthiness and step into, no, the word of God says, I'm so worthy, more than Jesus dying for you. Guys, the gospel, if you, it, you know, I'm not going to get to sharing that. It is what I do. However, um, it's more than that. It's life abundant now, not just waiting for the sweet by and by. Oh, Joe, I, I was just reading your comment about the basil. Oh my gosh, yes. So I, I water my basil and I notice it's kind of getting burnt and dying, probably because I do this on the little edges. Don't leave it alone until you clip it. Everybody knows, don't do that. In any case, see, we love our oils. And for me, I love herbs. I buy dry herbs. I brew echinacea, um, echinacea tea. I also get little tinctures. Um, it's, it's just, I love to engage all of that. Okay, I'm sorry, Brenda. I, okay, for those of you reading later or reading, my gosh, listening later, here's what you all need to know. If you're new, this is a family time. It's like you guys are sitting around my dining room table. I started doing this during the COVID years, right? And so we just kind of continue. So it's a family affair. So Brenda says, I can't harvest my basil anymore ever since I looked it up, to, uh, excuse, hooked it up to a frequency device and heard it sing. Um, next time I see you, Brenda, we're, I'm bringing some basil. We're going to, we're going to make your basil sing because I, I'm just curious. Did it, was it a good sound? Was it, it's kind of like, have y'all ever looked up, um, how it's the planets sing? Anybody ever looked that up on YouTube? There, there's your homework. YouTube, your planet, the planets sing. They have uh, songs of the planet, something like that. It's fascinating. Okay. Now we're digressing a little too far off. There, nothing really is digressing, right? Perhaps if you are, um, I was told it was my favorite plant, the sound got louder, interesting. Perhaps if you want to engage in your touch more, there's a certain type of fabric that you feel exceptionally stunning in. Wearing that fabric now hits another sense. Oh, thank you, Donna. Certain fabrics, we all have our thing. Certain fabrics speak to us. Bamboo, yes, that's a fantastic fabric. The feel of silk for some people or velvet. I love that um, it's like not, I guess it's not fleece, but it's that, that kind of, it used to be called teddy bear fabric. I had a pillow on a couch that you just, you know, touch it one way and it's real soft. It's just, it's delightful. And when my kids were sad, they would just rub it and we would talk. And, and so they're engaging different senses. The more you can engage your senses, the more you can get every part of your person on board, all of you. And you start to see all these amazing things that God created for you to engage with, to heal from, or to heal your, the negative, to heal from the negative stuff and step into the goodness that he has. Worthiness, as I've coached people over the years, and even when I would cut hair, this is one of the, the biggest issues that a lot of women have. It's almost as if from the womb, the, the enemy of their soul was out to get them, to cause women particularly to feel unworthy, to feel unloved. Whether you had a great set of parents, a wonderful father, when you go to school, sometimes people, kids can just be ugly. And when you step out and you have this really cool idea and those who don't quite see your brilliance yet, squash it down. Those words are hard to shake off. And they hit, they can ping in that unworthiness area. Yeah, or worthiness. Yes, Donna, unworthiness can be generational. Absolutely. If you're new to that concept of things being generational, understand that just like you have your parents, brown eyes, blue eyes, blonde hair, 
I was about to say blue hair. That's only if you're one of my kids and as a hairdresser, but that's unnatural. It doesn't get passed down. Um, freckles on your face, any of that, you also inherit emotions. You inherit patterns of behavior. Likes and dislikes. It's funny. My mom, I grew up hearing her say how she couldn't stand marzipan. I found out later it's because my dad, it was his favorite and she didn't like him. So, you know, she didn't like marzipan either. Um, and I always thought, well, marzipan is gross. Mom doesn't like it. I don't like it. Until I had my first piece when I lived in Germany, I was like, what the heck? It's so amazing. And it was just, and I didn't live with my dad, but maybe a year or maybe two or three years of my life. And I really like that taste. And now my kids, because I love it so much, I don't even know if they really like it, but they're obsessed with it too. We walk by C's candy. Mom, can we get a piece of marzipan? Who they might go, I just liked it because my mom liked it, right? And sometimes it's just in your DNA, your taste buds, what you enjoy can be from them, what you dislike can be from them. I have this weird love for musicals. Neither of my parents like musicals. I'm not sure if skipped a generation or what, but anybody likes musicals and want to go with me, I'd love to have a partner to go. The last thing I'd love for you guys to do tonight is write down five things that you love about yourself. Beginning with this, I love blank about myself. You guys, I had my kids do this this morning because I wanted to see how this would play out. They're my, they're my guinea pigs. I tried on them and then I share with you guys if it works. And from my 21 year old all the way down to my 10 year old, I'm like, okay, guys, write down what you love about yourself. And, and it was hilarious. You know, my, my, my littlest, she started out with, I love that I'm faster than all my siblings. I'm like, okay, let's not put anyone down while we say the things that we love about ourselves. And as we dug in a little bit deeper, it got to be really pulling out the things that they do like. Do you love that you're funny? Do you love that you're compassionate? Do you love how tall you are or how not tall you are? I used to want to be short because my grandma, my favorite person, the whole wide road was five feet on her best day. And I'm 5'11". And I always just, I want to be like her in every way. Now I love how tall I am. Do you love your hair? You always want to be tall, though. <laughs> that's funny. Do you love your voice? Do you know you have a sound, a beautiful, perfect sound? Your voice is exactly what God wanted. When you speak, even if you don't know God, he loves it. He made your voice. You might have more than five things. I would encourage you to keep this list and put it in a place where you can keep adding to it. You know, we live in a culture that's always trying to work on our weaknesses. I don't think it's for the culture to do that. It's for God and God alone to work on it. So even when somebody says, hey, you know what I love about you? Maybe it brings in awareness like, oh, I like that about me too. Add it in. Add that in. The next thing is, is write down five things that you'd love to do. Beginning each statement with, I would love to blank. And let me preface this by saying, don't make it, I'd love to clean out my closet someday. That's, that's, that's no fun. Let's not do that. I'd love to travel the world. I'd love to learn to sail. 
I'd love to visit every state in the United States. I'd love to write a book. I'd love to write a musical. I really would love to write a musical, except for I can't sing. So, and that's, I'm totally okay with that, but I don't know. We'll see. I'd love to write a screenplay, whatever it is, write it down. Joe, it's a learned skill. Huh. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, I just said God loves our voice, so who knows, right? As you keep writing these things, I know there's, um, everybody has something that's just pent up. And given the time and the space like this to just in with your own paper and by yourself, the words start flowing. Keep writing if that's what's happening. As you look at your list, five things you love about yourself, five things you'd love to do. If you're doing those things, I mean, if you're doing the five and you're, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know, let's say you're a, you raise horses, you train horses, whatever. If that's something that you would love to do, keep doing it, you want to keep doing it, then you know you're on the right path. But chances are, I've, I've worked with people long enough to know that this is more the norm than not. Chances are more of you in here are not 100% doing the thing that you love, that you would love to do, simply because you were never told it was okay to do that. And so as we talk about worthiness and then prep it for next week and we I think I'm just going to say we're going to talk about vision. We'll see what happens this week. But in the event we do continue on with that, catch a vision for what you were designed for. I know each of you have sat in some class at some point that challenged you and said, if money were no object and time wasn't a thing, what would you do? The sad thing is, is that we have to preface it with, if money was no object, what would you do to find out what we were designed for? You see, when you were being knit together in your mother's womb, every single part of you from your outer, right? Your skin, your hair, your nails, all the way down to who you are, to the things that you love, marzipan, musicals, mountains over beach, all of that was very specific to you and what you're designed to do. And when we feel worthy of do of whatever, when we just feel worthy, period, then we're able to step into all that we were designed to do. We're also able to be patient in the process of doing it. We're not rushed. We're not pushing or hustling. It's, it's like if you were designed to be a runner. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever read Eric Lytle's story. It's just one of my, it's one of my favorites. My kids and I read a lot of missionary stories because we like to real, read real history. It's a little hard to read history these days and find truth. Um, but we read these stories and they're usually autobiographies or biographies. And he, um, he's a chariots of fire guy. You probably know him because if you've seen that movie, then you know, but the, his story typically stops there and they leave the part off where he goes to China as a missionary and he dies at a tragically young age, but his story is really cool. But one of the things that he's quoted in saying is he just says he loves to run and he feels God's pleasure when he's running. I, I love running. Before my husband passed away, I ran, we ran a lot together. And I know that feeling. And I just wonder, 
if somebody was designed to run, and anytime I talk about running, there's always one or 20 people. They're like, I can't run. I don't like running. I'm like, I didn't ask if you like to run. It's not, it's not about you. We're just using this as an example. But if somebody feels like they were designed to run, how cool is it that they would feel God's pleasure when they run? And how cool is it that this man never gave a thought to, how am I going to make a living running? That wasn't on his mind. He ended up running in, um, uh, if you know his story, maybe you can help me, at some Olympics. Or the man who broke the four-minute mile, Roger Bannister. We all know that story. He did it. Then, and nobody said that it could be done. They all poo-pooed it, thought he was crazy. The human body, da da da. All the experts, all the doctors said no. He ran in the worst conditions with possibly the worst shoes. He did not have Nike or Under Armour, none of that. He had men's dress shoes to run uh, a sub four mile. And he did it. And the next year, eight people followed in his footsteps. I'm like, hmm, wow. All they needed to know that it was possible. And from there, you have the Usain Bolts, so all these people who run and compete. They're doing what God designed them to do. Are you? It's really cool when you are. Because all of a sudden, there's this settled peace of knowing, I was made for this. This is amazing. And you have days where, you know, there's traffic or things kind of, I don't know, chip you up. Your daughter gets a flat tire, so you have to stop riding and go get her and help her. It's something that happened to me today. But there's joy in it. Because at the end of the day, everything you're doing, everything you're walking in is what you were designed to do. So as you walk through this week, go back to your questions, go back to your things you love about yourself, the things that you would love to do. You might even have an addendum and say, if you're not doing those five things, or if it's not on the docket of these are goals I have in the next, you know, six months, one year, three years, ask yourself why. And I'll leave you with this. I feel like I do these classes sometimes just to bust open religious lies of the church. I don't know. My apologies if that's not your cup of tea, but here we are. Um, I, I just lost that thought. Maybe God's like, mm, don't say that. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Um, if you were not doing that thing. Oh, no, it came back. It was from him. Good. Many of us have been told that God only gives you enough light for the step that you're on, that he's not going to tell you the future. He's not going to lay out the next however many. Um, that's actually not right. There's nowhere in scripture it says that. And so all you have to do is ask. Because we all have used the GPS Right. If I want to drive to Deb's house and I'm guessing the Illinois area, I've just stalked you just a tiny bit on Facebook. Right. And I would need your address and I would do my GPS. And I might have two or three different paths to go, just depending on how long I want it to take. But the options are there. Why do we think that GPS is different than our God? Who do you think came up with that? It's a, it's a wonderful gift. All good and perfect things. Right. If you're reading a book, you read the book. You don't necessarily read it all in one night unless, I don't know, you're Brenda. I guess she reads 20 books a day, I think. So what she's meant not read. I'm, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> um, yes, he it gives us at least enough light for the next steps. But when you're reading a book and you put it down for the evening, you can't get through the whole book, you don't pick it up at chapter one the next day, right? We go on chapter two, three, four, wherever. We also know how many pages this book is to read. We know what it's going to look like. We know the end from the beginning. I do this with my kids. I've homeschooled them for years and years. And they know, they know 
we're doing Latin, we're studying this, we're studying this part of, of history, we're doing these books, we're writing this amount of papers, they know what's required. So as you seek out to do the thing that you were designed to do, ask, what does it look like in the end? What will this look like? Give me just a vision so that I can build out, so that we can build out. There might be several paths just for fun because God's not boring. Maybe you go this way, maybe you go that way, just like GPS. But I just want to encourage you to do that. In the next one year, two year, how many books will you write this year? How many classes do you need to take in order to get to this point? We, we plan for everything. I wanna encourage you to do that. Okay, so now we, before I turn off the recording, I just wanna ask, are there any questions, any aha moments that you have, something you wanna share before I stop the recording? You'll be able to ask questions that won't be recorded after we're done, but just in case it might help somebody else. Okay. 